Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody back for the final session. Uh, we've just had uh, a fantastic uh, two days of discussions, and this will be the culminating session uh, of this uh, tremendous symposium, or at least in my view it is. I've been in th you know, enthralled to hear from our panelists and speakers. Um, my name's Stephen Klingman. I'm director of the Interdisciplinary Studies Institute. Uh, I won't say too much more now, except that I will call on my colleague uh, from uh, the program in French and Francophone Studies, Professor Patrick Mensah, to introduce our uh, keynote speaker, Ashil Mbembe. Patrick. Good afternoon. Yeah, yeah. okay. Thanks, thanks. <laughs> Well, okay, uh, I also welcome you to this last event of the symposium. And um, it's also a particularly special privilege for me, you know, um, and a great honor for me to introduce uh, Professor Ashil Mbembe um, and to welcome him to, to, to the symposium and thank him for accepting to participate in it. Um, Professor Mbembe has developed in his work a critique of representations of Africa and people of African descent in mainstream discourses of the human and social sciences that has many synergies with the themes advanced in the iconic essay of Achebe that frames the symposium. Um, but he has also carried out, carried the torch in the spirit of Achebe's vision further by developing important articulations between his critiques of these particular problems of representation and conceptions of temporality and history in a philosophical discourse of modernity. Right? Between these critiques of representation and theories of contemporary governmentality, the logics of state structure and related themes of sovereignty, democracy, power, and general question of the political. As many of us know, um, Achille Mbembe is a professor of history and political science at the University of Witzwatersrand, or Witzwatersrand, right? <laughs> in Johannesburg, and a senior researcher at the Witz Institute for Social and Economic Research, Weiser, right? Weiser, okay. <laughs> He's also a convener of the Johannesburg Workshop in Theory and Criticism. Um, he was born in Cameroon and he earned a doctorate in history at the Sorbonne in France. Right? Now, as a public uh, cosmopolitan intellectual whose work is known around the world, he shares his time mostly between his home institution in South Africa, um, Europe, in the United States, and in, in the United States, particularly at Duke University, right, where he is currently a visiting professor in the Roman Studies Department, as well as the Franklin Humanities Institute. Um, he does maintain a very energetic and highly mobile and intensive regime of scholarship, teaching, research, and conferencing. Now, as a public and critical intellectual who maintains a keen engagement with pressing contemporary and social issues and political problems, he never shies away from relating his scholarship to real-time public events, when the time right, right? Um, he has held positions at Columbia University, the Brooklyn Institute in Washington, D.C., the University of Pennsylvania, the Council for the Development of Social Science and Research in Africa, which is located in Dakar, Senegal, um, the University of California at Berkeley, Yale University, Harvard University, I don't know whether I've listed all of them, but let's go on. <laughs> As one would expect, right, he has published extensively on questions of African history and politics. But his writings do not treat these subjects of history and politics in their provincial way. Um, they are always set in a larger framework of major currents of contemporary world history and path-breaking critical interrogations of philosophical and theoretical discourses with which we make sense of such events. Um, in his seminal work on the post-colony, 
which was published in this country in 2001. Uh, Mbembe explains problems of representation of the kind Achebe actually alludes to in his essay which defines the theme of this symposium. I mean, he explains them as effects or byproducts of long-standing uh, long difficulties that the idea of a common human nature or the idea of a humanity shared with others have posed for the West and its intellectual history for a long time. Now, it means, among other things, that this intellectual tradition has been unable to define itself in relation to non-Western societies, but especially Africa, without assigning simultaneously to Africa and people of African descent the tropes of absence, lack, otherness, difference, non-being, uh, nothingness, among others that are kind of known already. Now, one paradoxical consequence of this series of negations is that Western social theory and its related disciplines, Professor uh, uh, Mbembe says, right, um, they have rendered themselves unable to account adequately. Right. Okay. Oh, sorry. Okay. Hear me well? <laughs> um, these disciplines, the social theory and its related disciplines, have rendered themselves unable to account for the historicity and complexity of the life experiences of African societies in any depth. Right? Even though since the 15th century, at least, there is no longer, or there should be no longer, a distinctive historicity of these societies which is not embedded in times and rhythms heavily conditioned by European domination. And even though, Africa remains a figure of mediation which enables the West, according to Professor Mbembe, to accede to its own unconscious in order to give a public account of its subjectivity. Now, in making such claims, Professor Mbembe is not only referring to familiar histories of slavery and classical colonialism that one knows about, and the racialized thinking in which they were mired, in the same book, Right. He refers to a certain state of arbitrariness that accomplishes its own work and validates itself through its own sovereignty uh, and thereby permits power to be exercised as a right to kill and invest Africa with um, deaths at once at the heart of every age and above time. This arbitrariness, in his words, is what distinguishes our own present age from previous ones. And that distinction consists of a type of existence that is contingent, dispersed, powerless, but reveals itself in the guise of arbitrariness and the absolute power to give death anytime, anywhere, by any means, and for any reason. Um, in short, he's referring to often murderous practices of exclusion marginalization, instrumentalization, which he associates with various forms of late modern state structures. Um, somewhere he writes that late modern colonial occupation uh, differs in many ways from early modern occupation, particularly in its combining of the disciplinary, uh, the biopolitical, and the necropolitical. Now, if I had more time, these reflections should normally lead me to a discussion of these practices of marginalization which he associates with late modern state formations and other less orthodox modes of governance. This should lead to a discussion of the concept of sovereignty which he redefines and relocates to a large degree in the power and the capacity to dictate who may live and who must die in another important essay, which he calls what? Necropolitics. Right? Um, this should lead me to explain why Mbembe thinks, following Michel Foucault, that biopower, as the power over life itself, should also be thought in terms of the state, of the state of exception. Right? In examining the relationship between politics and death, given that such biopower is fundamentally about classifying populations, 
into categories that are deemed worth saving and those subject to dying or killing. Now, today, he argues, many people live in occupied zones of militarized terror that operate effectively as new colonies um, in conditions that recall the living death of life as a slave. Now, to my mind, uh, this condition could be invoking the several things. I mean, <laughs> that could characterize a contemporary world. For example, I give two examples. Um, let's say a non anti foreigner immigrant refugee comes in Europe, for example. Or he might also be, could be referring to displaced populations living in the so called stateless conditions or near stateless conditions under the control of polymorphous and diffuse organizations, such as militias led by warlords um, or various war machines that are linked to the geographies of resource extraction and their enclave economies and their peculiar methods of managing multitudes, etc., etc. And then this point is that in these conditions, right, and in these spaces of exception, um, You want to tell me? <laughs> in this space of exception, um, nocturnal power of death, if you like, the nocturnal power of death is wielded as an ever present possibility, creating a permanent terror that sometimes only finds its resolution in suicide. And I could go into a discussion of politics of suicide and survival, as what he calls, but our, our, our hold off on that. Um, now, since the constraints will not allow me to discuss the aforementioned questions in any significant detail, let me just say this, right, one thing. That behind this analysis of necropolitics and necropower is ultimately what? <clears throat> the, okay, now, the point behind it is not ultimately, you know, to paint a completely bleak and pessimistic picture of the future for Africa the people of African descent or the multitude of displaced populations whom he invokes in several of his studies of marginalized or marginalization in modern forms of governance. Nor are they meant to suggest that nothing can be done to address these problems in a constructive way. Nembe has explained that the problem of dream or dream underlying his book on the post-colony is one of freedom from servitude and the possibility of an autonomous African subject. Um, emerging, focusing on him or herself, withdrawing in the acts and context of displacement and entanglement. And the dream of a more recent book of his, which is called Critique de la Raison Negre, which I might call the critique of um, Black reason doesn't resonate very well, but, but that's, there you go, <laughs> right? Um, the dream behind that is what he calls a world to come in which there is no neck because there's no race, a world without resentment and desire for revenge that all racisms inspire, right? Right. Um, now, with all that said, the time is perhaps right to ask Professor Mbembe what his vision of Achebe and the African century might be. In any case, that's the title of his uh, presentation. So let's um, all give a rousing Pioneer Valley Fife College welcome to Prof. <laughs> Ashe, Ashe. I would like to thank Patrick for uh, that uh, comprehensive introduction, I have to say. Uh, 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 um, I was very happy when I, I got an invitation uh, to come here, an invitation from, from our dear Stefan and, and his colleagues, uh, Joey, uh, Sabina, Britt, uh, Michael, and uh, <clears throat> the, uh, the sponsors of uh, 40 years after. So I would like to, to thank them for their very gracious uh, invitation. Um, I think that the last two days have been uh, um, um, a very singular opportunity um, to, to remember 
uh, a man uh, many of us have uh, only met through the living traces uh, he left behind. Uh, he left them behind in, in writing. Uh, a man uh, to whom we owe uh, a debt of gratitude we will never be able to, to pay back. We will never be able to pay it back precisely because uh, what he gave us uh, is priceless and immeasurable. So the question is how to think with and after him. Uh, how to think with Achebe after Achebe. It seems to me that in order to, to do this, uh, we have to keep in mind a few, few things. The first is that, like many of his generation and the generations before his, Chinua Achebe understood his as a work of redress. The work of redressing, I quote him, needs to be done. It may appear too daunting, but I believe it is not one day too soon to begin. He proclaimed in the conclusion of his uh, An Image of Africa. Of course, uh, he very well knew this work had effectively begun long ago, well before his uh, Image of Africa it was a daunting work because since the advent of modernity, Africa had been made to be the name given to the underside of our world. A reality that could only be spoken of from a distance. Uh, anecdotally, the simulacrum for an obscure and blind power world in a time that was, in essence, pre-ethical. This Achebe understood very well. <clears throat> the work of redress was daunting because since the advent of modernity, when it came to the term or to the name Africa, Or when it comes to that name, everything flows from the extraordinary difficulty of producing a true image that can be associated to a world that is also true. Achebe knew that whenever Africa comes up in the Western logos, the correspondence between words images, and the thing matters very little. It is not necessary for the name to correspond to something or for a thing to respond to its name. At any moment, the thing can lose its name and the name its thing. Without this having any consequence whatsoever on the statement itself or on what is said, how it is said, who is saying it, and why. That is why Achebe's obsession was to bring an end to that logic. To bring an end to the logic that made it such that the name Africa always seems to direct us not only to what no one is supposed to respond to, but also to a kind of primordial arbitrariness, a kind of total abdication of responsibility he finds especially in the work of Conrad. So his point was not so much that 
Conrad was a racist, although indeed he was, and Achebe is very clear about this. His point was that Conrad couldn't be taken as a great writer because Conrad for, for, forgot that art is about giving form and giving life. Conrad forgot that image and form did not need to be separated. In fact, they could be reconciled in the object and their reconciliation in the object is what endows them both with a singular animating power. In this, Achebe was to a large extent relying on what has constituted over a long uh, period of time the power or the magics of the arts of Africa and its diaspora. That power historically has come from an unambiguous recognition of the fact that the infinite cannot be captured in a form. The infinite exceeds every form, even if from time to time it passes through form, that is, through the finite. But what fundamentally characterizes form is its own finitude. Form can only be ephemeral, evanescent, and fugitive. And to form, to make forms, to produce forms, is to inhabit a space of essential fragility and vulnerability. This is the reason why caring and nurturing life are and have been the main functions of art in Africa and its diaspora. Achebe singled out Conrad because Conrad was an archetypical example of a certain kind of abdication of responsibility when it comes to Africa. But Conrad was not the first, nor was he going to be the last. He was not the first in writing about Africa in 1830-1831 this is what Hegel, the renowned German philosopher, had to say, and I quote him. The peculiarly African character is difficult to comprehend for the very reason that, in reference to it, we must quite give up the principle which naturally accompanies all our ideas. The category of universality, in particular, in Negro life, the characteristic point is the fact that consciousness has not yet attained to the realization of any substantial objective existence, as for example, God or law, in which the interest of man's volition is involved and in which he realizes his own being. Originally presented in a lecture series and later compiled in The Philosophy of History, Hegel added, and I quote him again, the Negro exhibits the natural man in his completely wild and untamed state. We must lay aside all thought of reverence and morality, all that we call feeling, if we would rightly comprehend him. There is nothing harmonious with humanity to be found in this type of character. Hegel then promised himself not to ever mention Africa again. For, I quote him again, it is no historical part of the world. It has no movement or development to exhibit, 
what we properly understand by Africa, he concluded, is the unhistorical and developed spirit still involved in the conditions of mere nature, end of quote. So Conrad was not the first, nor was he going to be the last. More than a century after Hegel's ruminations, Robert Kaplan, a US journalist and policy pundit, published The Coming Anarchy, a devastating portrayal of West Africa in the February 1994 issue of the US monthly magazine, The Atlantic. The Cold War had just ended and most of the Western world was triumphantly riding on the peak of optimism. Celebrating this triumph of the West and of what he called the Western idea, Francis Fukuyama, writing in a 1989 issue of the National Interest, an American bi-monthly international affairs magazine, suggested, quote, what we may be witnessing is not just the end of the Cold War or the passing of a particular period of post-war history, but the end of history as such. In his scenario for the 21st century, the post-historical century, if we are to uh, stick for a moment with Kaplan's, uh, sorry, Fukuyama's period periodization, in, in that scenario, Kaplan argued that West Africa in particular was becoming, and I quote, the symbol of worldwide demographic, environmental, and societal stress in which criminal anarchy emerges as the real strategic danger. Disease, overpopulation, unprovoked crime, scarcity of resources, refugee migrations, the increasing erosion of nation states and international borders, and the empowerment of private armies, security firms, international drug cartels, are now most tellingly demonstrated through a West African prison. In Kaplan's geography, just as in Hegel's a century earlier, West Africa became the epitome of those regions of the world where central governments were withering away, tribal and regional fiefdoms were on the rise, and war and corruption had turned pervasive. West Africa, Kaplan argued, was reverting to the Africa of the Victorian Atlas. It consists now of a series of coastal trading posts such as Freetown and Conakry, and an interior that, owing to violence, volatility, and disease, is again becoming, I'm still quoting him, as Graham Greene once observed, blank and unexplored. Kaplan invoked the English political economist Thomas Malthus, describing him as the philosopher of demographic doomsday and a prophet of West Africa's future. And West Africa's future eventually will also, quote him, be that of most of the rest of the world in an age of cultural and racial clash, he concluded. This apocalyptic view of Africa's future was echoed in 2000 when building upon Hegelian tropes once again, the influential UK financial weekly, The Economist, declared that Africa was hopeless. In a famous editorial titled Hopeless Continent, it conjured up images of destitution, failure and despair, floods and famine, poverty and pestilence, brutality, despotism and corruption, dreadful wars and plunder, rape, cannibalism, amputation, and even the weather to suggest that 
Africa's future was definitely doomed. Foreign aid workers, peacekeeping missions, humanitarian agencies, and the world at large could well give up. So deeply, and I quote, buried in their cultures were the reasons for so much human misery, uh, it concluded. So as we uh, stand here to remember Achebe, poverty and unemployment are still widespread on the continent. In some instances, more so than in other, any other emerging markets, to use uh, that uh, uh, term. In many quarters of the rich world, Africa, with its apparently never-ending tales of disorder, still inspires pity and disbelief when it does not elicit deeply held humanitarian and philanthropic impulses, and of course, the contempt that usually comes with them. People still struggle to make ends meet, but these days, where don't they? They still demand products that could be both cheap and reliable. Needs are still obvious. Scarcity is still a fact. They don't always have enough to eat. They may lack education. They may despair at daily injustices. And some want to emigrate. Many still fear a violent or premature end. But that's not all. Secondary school enrollment has grown by 48% between 2000 and 2008. Over the past decade, malaria deaths in some of the worst affected countries has declined, declined by 30% and HIV infections uh, by 74%. Life expectancy across Africa has increased by about 10%, and child mortality rates in most countries have been falling steeply. Over the past 10 years, real income per person has increased by more than 30%, whereas in the previous 20 years, it shrunk by nearly 10%. Only 20% of the continent's 1 billion people are online. But that share is rising rapidly as mobile networks and are rolled out and the cost of internet capable devices continues to fall. As a matter of fact, more than 720 million Africans have mobile phones and 100 million were on Facebook by 2014. Mobile telephony in particular has revolutionized the ways Africans interact, and the way small and medium enterprises, farmers, and informal traders operate. As a result, mobile revenue is today equivalent to 3.7% of African GDP, more than triple its share in developed economies where it was an incremental innovation. It is calculated that in this leapfrog scenario, Increased internet penetration and use could propel private consumption almost 13 times higher than the current levels of $12 billion, reaching some $154 billion by 2025. I could go on and on and give you such examples of the set of transformations unfolding in front of our eyes in the continent. What I want to say is that as we enter the 21st century, the Conradian Hegelian Kaplan mythology and uh, its multiple actualizations either manifestly no longer holds or is under severe duress. Something else is going on. It is being picked up both by 
Africans themselves. And curiously enough, but we should, shouldn't really be curious, uh, express curiosity in this, by the world of high finance. A tacit consensus is emerging around the idea that after China, what is going on in Africa will have a huge impact, not only on Africa as such, but on our planet. The emerging tacit consensus is that the destiny of our planet will be played out to a large extent in Africa. If there is one single idea I wish you to take from this intervention, this is it. The planetary turn of the African predicament. This planetary turn of the African predicament, I suggest, will constitute the main cultural and philosophical event of the 21st century. It will take us far away from the Hegelian Conradian myths I cited at the start of this lecture, myths which, as I also suggested, Chino Achebe spent a huge part of his life trying to dispel. This planetary turn of the African predicament is the result of an ongoing, not yet entirely manifest, but an ongoing conceptual shift about which I would, I would like to make three comments. Firstly, that Africa is gradually perceived as the place where our planetary future is at stake or is being played out. This is due to the fact that all around the world and especially in Africa itself, all the senses of time and space based on linear notions of development and progress are being replaced by newer senses of time and futures founded on open narrative models. And what strikes me about Chino Achebe's uh, concept of the story which we have been speaking about a lot over the last, uh, since yesterday, it is his attachment to the idea of an open story. As opposed to a closed story, a la Fukuyama, history is finished, welcome to melancholia and boredom. If anything, Africa is not a place where we are bored. And we find in the work of Chino Achebe, in his concept of the open story, enough cultural, artistic, political resources to make sense of these times of ours. Secondly, within the continent itself, its artists, its music, its painting, its professionals, a younger generations of professionals, most of whom have a, a, an acute sense of the world as well as an acute sense of their own location. They have traveled abroad. Some of them are coming back. Others are moving to new uh, locations in the planet, especially Asia, China, India, Turkey, the Gulf countries. Within the continent itself, Africa's future is more and more thought of as full of unactualized possibilities, of would-be worlds of potentiality. Many increasingly believe that through self-organization and small ruptures, we can actually create myriad tipping points that may lead to deep alterations of the direction the continent is taking. This was not at all the case when I returned back to Africa in 1996. Thirdly, 
In fact, it has of late been a matter of tacit consensus once again, especially among international financial institutions, that Africa represents the last frontier of capitalism. Whether this is good or bad, of course we have to debate it. But the fact is that many now recognize that the continent represents the last frontier of capitalism. Of course, this last claim is contested in various quarters. But there is nevertheless ample evidence to support it. I'll give you two examples. The first relates to an obvious fact. Africa's economic pulse has been quickening during the first decade of the 21st century. Real GDP rose by 4.9% a year from 2000 through 2008, more than twice its pace in the 80s and the 90s. Of course, when I say that, I mean, I'm opening a Pandora box. Who benefits from it? Why is it that growth is not translated into employment? Why is it that in a country like South Africa, inequalities have not stopped expanding over the last 20 years? Of course, these questions are with us. And yet the fact is that the amount of wealth created in the continent has expanded. Even more crucial to the ongoing transformation is the resurrection of the middle class. I say resurrection because historically we have had a middle class, I would argue, from uh, the early pre uh, colonial period up to uh, the end of the 70s. Because of the structural adjustment programs of uh, the beginning of the 80s and uh, the last 25 years up to the beginning of the, uh, the century, we witnessed a quasi decimation of African middle classes. De decimation in the sense that many uh, uh, underwent a process of uh, declassement. Uh, I can't remember what the term is in English, but instead of going up, they went down in terms of re their revenues, and a lot of them left the continent. But what we have been seeing since the beginning of the century is a reconstitution of a black middle class, translated in uh, terms of rise in income, uh, capacity uh, to, to, to consume, uh, the fact that 40% of the continent's 1 billion people live in cities, a proportion roughly comparable to, to China's, and larger than India's, uh, estimations being that uh, by 2035, that share will rise to, to 50%, and Africa's top 18 cities will have a combined spending power of $1.3 trillion. This might be controversial, but it does matter. So, Africa represents the last frontier of capitalism in another second sense. It is against all odds a region of our world where some of the most far-reaching formal and informal experiments in neoliberal deregulation have been taking place. I have a lot of friends in, in Greece. You know what has been going on in Greece? When read from an African perspective, this is what we went through in the 80s. It is in Africa that we have seen the most far-reaching, both formal and informal experiments in neoliberal deregulation with the, the range of consequences this has entailed uh, uh, both there and uh, uh, elsewhere. Even more decisively,
This is the region of the world where the relationship between transnational extractive projects, which underpin uh, a huge part of Africa's economic growth uh, during the late 20th and early 21st century, and the transformations of contemporary global financial capitalism, especially under the sign of enclave economies and offshoring, have been the most perversely tested. During the last decade, Africa made its greatest ever contribution of illicit, uh, you, you mentioned it, financial outflows and net income payments to the rest of the world. I could give you uh, uh, extended figures about this. So the point is that as a, a site of experimentation, Africa's extractive economies have been deeply involved in and will keep contributing to uh, the shaping of key aspects of contemporary financial capitalism. The remaking, for instance, of the corporate form at the global scale, <coughs> the structures and conditions of corporate activity, and what it means to incorporate in the first years of the 21st century. Uh, same with the monetization of risk, a key structural feature of contemporary futures markets. All of this has been shaped to a large extent by experiments with new forms on the African continent. So have been offshoring, including of means of violence, private contracting, including of security services, gambling, other economically uh, stigmatized activities, and various invocations in the field of tax avoidance. So the point is that all of this is murky. Uh, it's not a one-way traffic, it's murky, but it's open-ended. It's open-ended, and what it ends up becoming will depend to a large extent on the quality of the new social struggles that are unfolding almost everywhere in the continent, both in uh, the urban form and even more importantly, in the rural form. So, the current moment in the continent can be characterized as a moment of acceleration. The question is acceleration towards what? What are the forces behind this acceleration? Is such historical trajectory sustainable? At what cost? and who is likely to pay for it or to benefit from it. Acceleration, I would say, towards a kind of capitalism that is mostly disjointed. In the sense that it consists of seemingly random collection of disconnected enclaves. These enclaves are incongruously linked together in a contrived form that cannot be easily grasped within the conventional analytical paradigms. It is a capitalism of multiple nodal points, scattered patterns, spatial growth combined with neglect and decline, and this form of capitalism is mostly extractive. What is even more uh, say, uh, striking is the fact that just as Africa is now, not only uh, uh, is now a planetary question, as I was intimating earlier on, it is also more and more specifically a Chinese question. China is externalizing its capitalism in Africa. But what aspects of Chinese capitalism are being externalized in Africa? It's precisely a capitalism of the kind I was describing a little earlier, made up of enclaves, basically extractive in nature, and uh, ecologically uh, costly. I mention the ecology because 
people across the continent have been living with and adapting to a high degree of climate variability and its associated risks for centuries. Yet uh, the accelerated changes in the climate and increasing incidence of climatic disasters uh, during the 20th century have brought risks into sharper focus. They threaten to erode Africa's natural assets, land productivity, livestock, water and energy resources, its capabilities, health, nutrition, education, while keeping the region in a low human development tra trap. This scenario is exacerbated by the continent's natural fragility. Two thirds of its surface area is desert or dry land. Its terrestrial and coastal ecosystems are highly exposed to natural disasters. The region's livelihoods and economic activities are very dependent on natural resources and rain-fed agriculture. I could go on and on with this. But the continent is central to the global environmental crisis and holds some of the most potent solutions to the global ecological trap overshadowing the 21st century. Although its forest coverage has shrunk, Africa is the home to the second largest mass of tropical forest in the world, uh, which means that the carbon storage capacity of African bio, uh, biotopes is considerable. And at a time when global emissions are rapidly rising, this gigantic carbon capture machine is uh, like agricultural land, one of the essential elements of climate control. By which I mean that if we are to tackle what is arguably the biggest threat to human existence in our times, we will have to deal with Africa. Now let me end where I started with, that is with race and racism and the future of the human species in this post conradian age and the planetary turn of the African predicament. As we speak, race has once again re-entered the domain of biological truth viewed now through a molecular gaze. A new molecular deployment of race has emerged out of genomic thinking. Worldwide, we witness a renewed interest in terms of the identification of biological differences. In these times of global migrations, many are entertaining the dream of nations without strangers. Genomics has injected new complexity into the figure of the human. We have been wondering about the figure of the human Achebe was grappling with. And yet the core racial typology of the 19th century still provides the dominant lens through which this new genetic knowledge of human difference is understood and indeed is taking shape and entering medical and lay conceptions of human variation. Fundamental to these ongoing re-articulations of race and these recordings of racism are developments in the life sciences. I already mentioned genomics. I should add our renewed understanding of the cell, uh, neuroscience, and synthetic biology. The last quarter of the 20th century has seen the rise of a molecular and neuromolecular style of thought that analyzes all living processes in body and brain in terms of the material properties of cellular components such as DNA bases, 
uh, ion uh, channels, membrane potentials, and the like. This process continues to wield influence in the 21st century. It is a process that has been rendered even more powerful by its convergence with two parallel developments. The first is the emergence of the digital technologies of the information age, and the second is the financialization of the economy. These developments have in turn shaped two sets of consequences. On the one hand, there is a renewed preoccupation with the future of life itself. Something that is not really part of Achebe's critique of uh, Conrad's racism. Future of life itself, and on the other hand, uh, capital uh, and uh, the work it is doing under contemporary conditions. So we now realize that there is probably more to the idea of race and racism than even Hegel or Conrad imagined. Because race thinking increasingly entails profound questions about the nature of the human species in general, the need to rethink the politics of racialization and the terms under which the struggle for racial justice unfolds here and elsewhere in the world today has become ever more urgent. It cannot be done uniquely through Achebe's lenses. That's the point I'm trying to make. We need to supplement Achebe if we are to address the new rearticulations of racism, the recording of racism in the world of our times. Racism is still acting as a constitutive supplement to nationalism. How do we create a world beyond nationalism? Behind the veil of neutrality and impartiality, racial power still structurally depends on various legal regimes for its reproduction. And we are in America, How do we radically we the law, transform I the mean, law? For instance, the police. Even more ominously, as I intimated, race politics is taking a genomic turn. In order to invigorate anti-racist thought and praxis, and in order to reanimate the project of what we call in South Africa non-racialism, we particularly need to explore the emerging nexus between biology, genes, technologies, and their articulations with new forms of human destitution. Also at stake, once again, are the old questions of who is whom, who can make what kinds of claims on whom, and on what grounds, who is to own whom, and what, do we owe anything to each other? So in a contemporary neoliberal order that claims to have gone beyond the racial, the struggle for racial justice must take new forms. But simply looking to past and present will not suffice. To tease out alternative possibilities for thinking life and human futures, we need to connect in entirely new ways the project of non-racialism to that of human mutuality. In the last instance, and here I draw from our experience in South Africa, non-racialism is truly about radical sharing and universal inclusion. It is about humankind ruling in common on behalf of a larger commons which includes non-humans, and this is the proper name for the kind of democracy that is to come. So let me end this presentation 
to reopen the future of our planet to all who inhabit it. Because that was the purpose of Achebe's critique of Conrad. Conrad was closing the future to some while keeping it open only for some. But to reopen the future of our planet to all who inhabit it, we will have to learn how to share it again amongst the humans and the non-human, between the multiple species that populate it. It is only under these conditions that, aware of our precariousness as a species in the face of ecological threats, we will be able to overcome the outward possibility of human extinction opened up by this new epoch, the Anthropocene. As far as Africa is concerned, certain things might have fallen apart, but many are emerging. Some have no name yet, so we need to expand the dictionary to give them name, a name. Africa's time will come. This might not happen in our lifetime, but it will come. Our task is to accelerate its advent, and for this to happen, a new anticipatory, future-oriented politics, future-oriented literature, music, and the arts is badly needed. Thank you very much. Thanks to Professor Mbembe for an invigorating talk. Now he'll gladly take questions from the audience, a few questions. So, the floor is yours. Hello, thank you so much for um, your keynote speech. I thought it was really, there. okay. I thought it provided a lot of um, really informative and relevant information. Um, I wanna start by saying uh, my dissertation chair, Percy Henson says hello, so hi. But anyway, um, so my question, please excuse the meandering and fumbling through it, but uh, my question um, kind of deals or is about the discursive formation of Africa contemporarily. So you spoke about how Africa is now being positioned as the final frontier of capitalism. It's been called the new Asia, the bright continent, Africa rising. And I'm just wondering about if this kind of shift in discourse towards Africa might be you know, two sides of the same coin with the construction of Africa as a dark continent in as much as it seems that um, it's constructing, it's, it seems to be rationalizing poverty in a particular way. For, so for instance, like the entrepreneurial spirit of the African is, is that's been popular in kind of <clears throat> economic and business magazines is really kind of rationalizing the fact that there's a huge disparity in wealth and that these people don't actually need more because they're able to do these amazing things with so little. So I wonder if um, kind of the naturalist discourse of Hegel and of Conrad is being reconstituted in, the, in a particular historicist discourse about Africa that, you know, now Africa is emerging from the waiting room and it and presents kind of an anecdote to capitalism reaching its um, inexorable asymptote. Um, so yeah, so. There's a question somewhere in there, but thank you. <laughs> Look, the, the, um, uh, 
there's a, there's a, when it comes to Africa, uh, let's see, there's a polemical field out there. Uh, Africa has always been part of a polemical field, uh, part of which is uh, linguistic, uh, the rest is uh, economic, political, uh, symbolic, so forth and so on. It's, a, it's an arena of struggle. How is it that it will be defined? Um, and that is the struggle uh, people like Achebe and before him many. I mean, that has been our struggle from the very advent of modernity. Who will have the power to define uh, this entity, <clears throat> which is a geographical entity, which is at the same time a human entity? Um, so that struggle will keep going on. So the discourse of Africa is rising is clearly part of that century-long polemic. And uh, we have to be aware of that. What that discourse does is that it celebrates Africa's uh, uh, renewed rearticulation with uh, a, a, a global system that um, has now almost no outside. A position which itself is a bit an historical because in fact, Africa has always been part of it. In fact, Africa was there at the very moment when it, it was constituting itself. And as a consequence of which, there's no history of the world that is not African to some extent. So it's a polemical field. We have no choice. We have to, 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 to do battle in that field. But more importantly, Africa has to become its own project. From the 19th century on, in the writings of African Americans, people from the diaspora, the people on the continent itself, our big preoccupation has been how is it that Africa becomes once again its own center? And what I was suggesting is that the project of Africa becoming once again its own center is back on the agenda in the continent itself. Not only with the African Union, the limits of which we know of, but more importantly, in the consciousness of our times. And that seems to me to be a, a, a very important rapture. So the question, once again, that is what it is. How is it that Africa will become its own center? For its own sake, but also for the sake of the planet. That our planet, as it faces these tremendous threats, some of them ecological, others related to a rampant form of economic exploitation that has invested not only economic resources, natural resources, but life itself now, that, that it might be that the um, Pre-emergence of the continent as its own center is probably the condition for uh, the, uh, I don't want to use theological terms such as salvation or redemption, but, but, but that, uh, um, the, it, is, it has become somewhat the condition for a rejuvenation of our planet uh, as we enter these epochal change I called, or many have called, the Anthropocene. So that was the, uh, that's the historical, let's say, set of reflections. A reading of Chinua Achebe's piece forces us to engage in, with him, but also after him. And if necessary, although I didn't hear too much of that since yesterday, against him, which, which you, you, <laughs> you, you mischievously, 
<laughs> introduce, but nobody seemed to follow you uh, along those directions. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Professor Mbembe, for a very stimulating talk. Uh, I want to return again to the metaphor that you use of Achebe's open story. Uh, can you tell us, in your estimation, what the place of infrastructure and new kinds of leadership are in determining uh, uh, determining a more a sanguine ending to this open story, particularly when you, we live in an era where uh, the imperial supply chains for things like platinum uh, and other strategic raw materials that uh, reside largely in Africa are in a moment of, uh, I wouldn't call it stagnation, but I mean, there's huge stockpiles of platinum uh, in, in your adopted country, South Africa, uh, and the auto industry is undergoing uh, tremendous transformation as a result of that, and the hastening toward electric cars as a result of all of that. So where, where, where would the, the sort of opening up the infrastructure, expanding Africa's infrastructure and uh, acquiring a new kind of leadership which could bring this sort of moment of, of stasis to an end. Where do they stand, where do they play, how do they play in your, the open story? I mean, this is a, uh, <clears throat> it has to be a, a point of, of, of serious debate. The, um, um, the, the hypothesis I was, I was putting forward is precisely that uh, this is not a moment we can characterize as a moment of stasis. I was suggesting that uh, what is striking, as far as I, I can see, is the uh, um, reopening of the question of the future as part of uh, current uh, political and economic struggles and cultural struggles. I was suggesting that something is, is moving. In the 80s, um, we clearly were uh, witnessing a historical moment of, of decline. All the signs of decline and stasis were there. That is no longer the case. But maybe it might be uh, more uh, um, prudent or cautious to simply argue that uh, Africa is going in multiple directions simultaneously. In the 80s, we knew where it was, it was going backward. Today, we cannot say that. And we have to take it seriously. So, it's going in many different directions simultaneously, which means that anything can happen. Anything can happen depending on the, um, the ways in which the social forces will, what social forces will be able to organize themselves. Depending, of course, on what social forces are uh, carrying uh, uh, what forms of, of leadership. But as, as Chima was uh, telling us uh, in the early afternoon, um, Leadership, of course, is important, but, but systemic things, that is where we have to, to put our, our attention. Um, you mentioned platinum uh, in the case of South Africa, and, or, or for that matter, Kortan in the Congo, uh, uh, the continent is a geological scandal in, in, in whatever uh, 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 form we want to, to take it. Um, and, and here again, um, what is really important are the actual social struggles that are going on around these mineral resources. In South Africa in particular, uh, you see, I mean, this will take a little bit of the development for those of you who are not familiar with the history of the place. Um, 
white people occupy something like, uh, um, I can't remember the exact figures, but 100 minus 13 is uh, 70, 77 percent, whatever, of the land. Uh, black people occupy 13 percent of the land. Early on, they were relegated to those uh, uh, territories uh, because they were deemed to, to be useless, basically. These were like uh, reserves, the Bantu stands, the homelands, overpopulated, overgrazing. Um, people struggled to, to, to reproduce themselves under those conditions. These were uh, territories that were basically uh, like warehouses where cheap labor was, was, was uh, uh, it wasn't like, like here in America where, I mean, Prisons serve that, that purpose, especially for black people. Uh, in South Africa, it was something else. Cheap labor, uh, that's how you uh, managed it. What has been discovered then is that, in, recently, is that, in fact, um, those territories are not as poor as it was thought. That, in fact, underneath those reserves lie huge mineral wealth. So these former reserves have become the new frontier for extractive forms of accumulation. Such is the case, for instance, in the whole platinum belt in the Hauteng uh, in particular. So what you see is a new uh, um, cycle of struggles as to who will control the process of extraction or the new process of accumulation rendered possible by the availability of these, this wealth. So what the government is doing under Zuma is that uh, since these territories were supposedly ethnic entities um, ruled by chiefs, he is trying to give more power to the chiefs who control land, who can then transact it with uh, uh, capital, monopoly uh, mineral capital. So you see a whole set of things going on there which blow up once in a while. Some of you might have in mind what happened in Marikana where 34 miners were killed in broad daylight by the police, an arm of a government that is controlled by black people. Black people killing black people. So you see that was a, a moment of uh, dramatization, high dramatization of those struggles. But a lot of it is going on in rural areas as who, to who will control this, this wealth? How will it be distributed? Who will lose from it? What's the cost of exploiting it? So the future will depend on who wins in these struggles. So it's not no one can determine it right now. It's open. And the fact that it is open and it is not closed is a characteristic one sees almost everywhere else in the continent. And that's a cause, if not for optimism, at least it prevents us from simply reproducing the Conradian or Hegelian mythology. And for those who really want to make a difference, make sure that our history is not simply a history of repetition, but a real history of difference. Then uh, it opens up an amazing opportunity. I'm sure Achebe would have uh, uh, very much liked to be part of. Sorry for that long answer. Let me ask you how far we can open it up in our own minds. Um, I've spent most of my professional life in and out of India. And the idea of development economics was a big program in the US and Europe and India. Both China and India, even the Soviet Union, going back a little further, their idea of development was more industrial development, right? Can Africa develop in an industrial way? 
Uh, I don't know who you, you have to do capitalism to someone, and I don't know who the Africans are going to do it to. So my question is, is there in fact a way other than industrial and development, what do you see that's concrete that really opens up in a different direction? It won't happen without some form of industrialization. Uh, that industrialization might not take exactly the same uh, form as what happened either in Europe in the 19th century or, or in China recently. B but very clearly, it won't happen without some form of industrialization. And a uh, number of uh, people are working on it. Uh, um, the, um, how far can we open up our, our own minds? Uh, I think, I mean, that's a question for, for you guys. Um, uh, we, we have our own questions, but it's probably not one of ours. Uh, the Chinese, for instance, are, seem to be uh, embracing that question much more uh, um, uh, in, in a way uh, that is much more dynamic than the West, which, as we know, is trapped in, in these mythologies we have been talking, talking about. The, um, what, what strikes me, I mean, I live, I've been living in Johannesburg for 15 years. I, I move around, as Patrick uh, 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 suggested. Um, you see the difference when you, you travel, for instance, from, you, you catch a flight from Johannesburg to Shanghai. Uh, there are two flights every day. Um, you see the difference between a flight going from Johannesburg to Shanghai and a flight going from Johannesburg to London. Um, a flight, or a flight, for that matter, going from Johannesburg to Lagos. You should see, you should, you should, you should travel from Johannesburg to Lagos. All kinds of people. Africans, Africaner-speaking people, uh, white businesses, new black capitalists, Nigerian uh, uh, business operators. When you put together Africaners and Nigerians, you produce something really extraordinary, <laughs> which, which I haven't seen elsewhere. So these things are happening. A new cartography is in the making. Most of it is eastern, it looks east. Of course, we still have traffic you know, coming to uh, the Atlantic seaboard and all that. But the most dynamics are within the continent itself and in relation to China. I was in Shanghai a year and a half ago to some, some conference. And at the end of the conference, my host tells me, oh, look, come on, I'll show you something. I'll show you how Africans live in China. He drove me uh, 60 or 70 kilometers out of Shanghai into an entirely a city of the kind I had never seen before. Nigerians, Ghanaians, Ugandans, uh, Kenyans, uh, Ga uh, Gambians, people from the Cameroons, uh, Senegal, owning shops, uh, business going on, some of them students, others doing all kinds of works, mixing up with the Chinese. We met some, some, some uh, uh, families, begin to see the emergence of Afro-Chinese young people with eyes like this, something I had not seen before. And uh, they, they the traffic is intensifying. New trading colonies, African trading colonies, establishing themselves in major cities in China itself, in Hong Kong, and in some other parts of Asia. So what's going on is that the map of our world is changing. Unfortunately, we don't have the discourse on that those changes, is lagging, lagging behind. China-Africa uh, cooperation, for the time being, is mostly economic. There's no cultural discourse that is accompanying it. Of course, you have a huge anti-Chinese sentiment in most parts of the continent, partly because there's no African metropolis today that doesn't have its chi Chinese neighborhood. You see Chinese in Douala, Cameroon, for instance, competing with 
locals in informal trade. In addition to those who come under the banner of uh, Chinese major uh, corporations. So the question, of course, uh, is how is it that we harness enough negotiating power to make sure that our relationship with China does not simply reproduce the extractive model that was there under colonialism. But in order to do that, we need a systemic rearrangement of our own polities and the invention of new forms of leadership that can are responsive, accountable uh, to their own people, which is a bit hardly the case right now. But all of that is exhilarating. It is a kind of thing, that a project that is, it is something that gives content to the idea, a Chebe idea that Africa is above all a project. If I take one thing from Chino Achebe's uh, writings in relation to the continent, it is that Africa is a project. It's uh, a geographical reality that has to be translated into an idea. And translating into it into an idea is the same as making of the continent once again, its own center, for its own sake, but also for the sake of the human race at large. I'm reluctant to ask this question because the last thing you said about Africa becoming a center and looking forward in a positive developmental way is something profoundly to be wished. But the text of your speech confused the hell out of me. I mean, I'm a poor old man, <laughs> culturally deprived Caribbean Negro. <laughs> but it sounds to me, like you said, you started out with a whole list of the denigration of Africa's character and post possibilities. And then you went on to, that hasn't changed, you went to modern, you went to The Economist and you went to various journalists, recapitulating the same thing. And then you said, but that's too swift a judgment because there's something happening in Africa, and I'm trying to remember your term, where you said it had a planetary, implication and Africa was a center. Right? And then when you listed the things that were happening, it seemed to me that there were the same things that had oppressed and distorted and created a dismal circumstance in independent Africa. You talked about extractive industries which are close to colonialism. You talked about uh, urbanization. When we know that people are run off of the rural areas where agriculture becomes no longer productive and operative. They run to the urban areas to the most dismal situation facing human beings on the planet today. The urbanization is not progress. Extractive industries are not progress because they run from the, they've moved from the Europeans to the Chinese. That will strike me as being obvious progress. And then you discuss the environmental degradation of the planet. You talked about how vulnerable Africa was with you know, two thirds of this, this land being drought. And the climate, the, the, the climate change created by the misuse of technology is likely to have disastrous consequences. They will displace huge populations, they will create famines, where rainfall comes where it doesn't come, and when the usual rain doesn't come, we're going to see crises of unprecedented proposal, pr uh, proportions. So it looks to me that Africa becomes a matter of planetary, I, I don't remember what the next word is, because it is facing all the problems which project across the planet, to Asia, to Europe, everywhere else, caused by, develop, by environmental degradation and social injustice. And if the planet is to survive, it seems to me you're saying, Africa will be the model 
Africa is a planetary canary in the gold mine. If Africa can survive, the planet can survive. Is that the planetary significance of Africa? And that the, the, the destructive forces confronting the, uh, the planet are playing themselves up in a more enhanced way in Africa. But if Africa can find the, res uh, the, the resources, intellectual, human, whatever else, to control and, cor uh, and correct that, Africa will center itself and the planet will, will survive. That, that isn't the thrust of your argument, can it, can it be, sir? Okay, thank you very much. Oh, <laughs> look, um, I live there, you know? I mean, I'm, I'm trying to make sense of what it is that I see. Uh, it's not as if, I'm, I'm not a visitor like Conrad. Uh, um, uh, I've been living there all this time. Uh, of course, I see uh, the, uh, the kind of uh, um, uh, terrible conditions that can be afflict, uh, inflicted on, on, on those societies uh, by all kinds of destructive forces. Uh, we can spend the evening here talking about destructive forces in the continent and elsewhere. I'm not sure that it will help us very much. Um, the, the, the challenge, uh, it seems to me, uh, is uh, to uh, take seriously the fact that um, the, the continent historically, uh, but even more so today, uh, because of all kinds of factors uh, uh, that are at play, um, um, uh, is, uh, it's, history is, is open-ended. And if we agree with the, uh, uh, the assumption that its history is not closed, it's not simply a history of destructive forces, but also of resistance and, and, and people organizing themselves to make something, make a meaning out of the life they, they, they live and the constraints they have to face. If we agree with that, then the kind of discourse you are uh, proposing uh, doesn't seem to me to hold. Um, um, I agree with your critique of uh, the kind of capitalism that is, uh, 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 is at work, uh, uh, in, not only in Africa, but I mean worldwide. Um, I try to um, um, uh, uh, suggest that that was the case. Uh, what I was interested in highlighting uh, in response to Achebe uh, and his critique of uh, uh, Conrad uh, is uh, a specific historical moment which I characterize as a moment of acceleration. Acceleration of everything, of destructive forces, but also of the capacity, historical capacity, this continent has uh, shown in, in, in uh, replenishing somewhat the forces of, uh, of life. Um, but I accept that, I mean, you can have a different uh, take on this. Um, what else? Uh, I think, think that, that's it. That brings our proceedings to a close. I want to thank uh, Professor Mbembe. I want to say thank you very much to my co-organizers, Ekwemi Michael Thelwell, Joy Bowman, Sabina Murray, Britt Russett. I want to thank uh, my assistants at the ISI, Amanda Warlagji and Vata van Alva, who's done an, who've done an incredible job. I especially want to thank all our speakers today, all our panelists today and yesterday. Uh, we've had an amazingly expansive couple of days here. I think sort of unprecedented on this campus. It's been a pleasure for me to be involved. I uh, hope you've enjoyed it. There's food out there. The discussion will continue, the questions and the attempts at answers. Thank you very much for joining us.